Hi everyone, my name is Sanjay Mukhopadhyay. I'm director of lung pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And today we're going to talk about a very um, so, sort of underappreciated clue to a distinctive malignant neoplasm. And the clue is positivity for P63 and negative staining for P40. So we're going to discuss immunohistochemical markers. Um, now, most of you would be familiar with what P63 is, and you, you must uh, use it in your practice if you're a pathologist. Around 2011, there were a slew of quite um, landmark papers that came out at that time that showed how to subtype poorly differentiated non-small cell lung carcinomas that were very difficult or impossible to subtype on H&E. And in the immunohistochemical panel that was devised, P63 was an important squamous marker. So as you can see in this picture, um, you have a poorly differentiated carcinoma. It's very difficult to tell if it's adeno or squamous on histology. But you can see that TTF1 is negative and P63 is diffusely positive. So that helps to tell you that this is a, a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So if we flip the paradigm, um, we look at adenocarcinomas. Those are positive for TTF1 and negative for P63 mostly. And also, the, you could also use other markers like Napsin and CK56. So after that paradigm was established and many labs around the country started to use this subtyping uh, sort of algorithm, uh, other papers came out showing that there's another squamous marker called P40. And the difference between P63 and P40 is frequently misunderstood, but I'm trying to summarize it in this chart. So P63 and P40 are equally sensitive. That's the, the bars on the left-hand side. And what that means is that if you stain 100 squamous cell carcinomas, virtually 100 of them will stain with P63 and 100 of them will stain with P40. So the sensitivity is identical. There's no difference in sensitivity. Where P40 is superior to P63 is in terms of specificity. And what that means is that if you stain 100 adenocarcinomas, 31% of them will stain with P63. So they are false positives in that sense. Whereas the false positivity rate is much lower with P40 in the range of 3%. So to summarize, P40 is a better marker because it's more specific than P63, not because it's more sensitive. Here's an example of a non-small cell carcinoma that's difficult to subtype on H&E because it has no glands, no mucin, no keratinization. So that's where we would use now our sort of abbreviated panel of uh, TTF1 and P40. And you can see that TTF1 is, is blazingly positive confirming a diagnosis of poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Now, if you look at the other markers here, P63 actually does have substaining, but I'll reiterate that a certain proportion, about 31% of lung adenocarcinomas do have focal P63 staining. That doesn't make it adenosquamous. It just means that you can get P63 positivity even in adenocarcinomas, especially this kind of focal patchy positivity. But in the same case, if you use P40, you see that that positivity virtually goes away. So P40 makes the life of the pathologist much easier when they're trying to use these staining algorithms. So we use this nowadays. We use TTF1 and P40 as our subtyping uh, panel when H&E fails. Now, with that background in mind, I'm going to show you this case. So look at this poorly differentiated malignant tumor. It's very poorly differentiated. There's no glands, no keratinization. It's reasonable to try and use a subtyping panel here that includes TTF1 and P40. Now in this particular case, TTF1 was negative, but um, take a look at the P63 and P40 in this case. It's so dramatically different. So the P63 shows strong and diffuse nuclear positivity of the kind you would expect in a squamous cell carcinoma, but P40 would, would also be expected to be positive in a squamous cell carcinoma, and here, it's essentially negative. Maybe you can find a rare positive cell, but essentially P40 is negative and P63 is diffusely positive. And you might wonder why would that happen? You just told us that P63 and P40 are equally sensitive. Shouldn't P40 also be staining this tumor? So I'd like to point out to you that this staining pattern should actually trigger in your mind the thought of this distinctive neoplasm, and that is called nut carcinoma, which is named after the nuclear protein in testis, um, uh, you, you know, uh, molecule after which this um, uh, tumor is named. And as you know, these are uh, characterized by fusions of the, of the nut um, with other partners, uh, most commonly BRD1. So the bread nut fusion is, the, is one of the most characteristic fusions. 
what is not well described is that there are actually uh, variable immunophenotypes including p63 positive p40 negative as i mentioned here um, the morphology of, the, of these tumors is now pretty well recognized. Um, as you can see on the left hand side, there are often foci of abrupt keratinization, meaning that it doesn't gradually keratinize from a basaloid to a more pink cell, it just abruptly has these pink keratinized cells. On the right hand side panels, you can see on the top that uh, sometimes these tumors can look like small round blue cells. And you might think, is this lymphoma or small cell carcinoma? In other cases, they look, the tumor cells are uh, big. They have large nuclei with vesicular chromatin and prominent eosinophilic nucleoli, so your differential would obviously include a non-small cell lung carcinoma. Now, if you go down the p63 positive uh, route, you would think this is a squamous cell carcinoma and you might diagnose this as squamous cell. If you go down the route of a uh, uh, p40 negative tumor, then you might be reasonable to, it might be reasonable to call this a poorly differentiated non-small cell carcinoma. So there are numerous pitfalls associated with the staining patterns in this tumor, which is called nut carcinoma, as I mentioned. Now, the paper that I'm basing this upon recently just came out last year in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology by Matsuda et al. And it showed in this small series of patients that you had a series of cases that were P63 positive, but P40 negative, or at best, focal or patchy. And you can see from the ages listed here in this table that these patients were all uh, very young, some as young as f uh, 14 years old, unfortunately. Um, so they were able to confirm either by immunohistochemistry or by showing the nut M1 re rearrangement that these were all nut carcinomas. Uh, so this is a, a data to support case cases like I showed you, uh, this particular uh, and distinctive immunoprofile of P63 positive and P40 negative. Uh, nut carcinomas are seen mostly in young people, you know, 30s, 40s, even younger than that sometimes. They frequently form mediastinal masses. Of course, nut carcinoma can occur in other sites too, non-midline non sites too. That's why the old name nut midline carcinoma has changed to nut carcinoma. They are extremely aggressive tumors um, with a median survival of seven, seven and a half to nine months. Um, and the, and the pathology is essentially that of a poorly differentiated malignant neoplasm. And once you get cytokeratin positivity in these, you'll come to poorly differentiated carcinoma, usually. It's then that you, you know, face the challenge of how to subtype it. So how do you confirm a diagnosis of nut carcinoma? Um, nowadays, we have a nut immunohistochemistry, which shows this characteristic speckled nuclear staining that you see in the, in the green circles. It's quite characteristic and, and quite easy to read. Uh, you can also do fish for nut, which is preferred because it catches all kinds of uh, fusion partners. You know, it catches the uh, positivity, you know, irrespective of the fusion partner. And you can do next generation sequencing, which will confirm the, the bread nut fusion. Both immunohistochemistry for nut and NGS for nut are now available at Cleveland Clinic Labs. And we are using this in our practice and finding it very, very helpful, both for in-house cases as well as for cases that are sent in to us for consultation. So if you have a case like this where you suspect nut carcinoma, um, please feel free to send it to us and we can help you to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, we are aware that many labs in this country do not yet have any means to confirm nut carcinoma in-house. When should you suspect nut carcinoma? I've touched on this already, but I'll summarize it here. If your patient is young, if there's a mediastinal mass, if the carcinoma is poorly differentiated, if you see evidence of abrupt keratinization, if the cells are clearly malignant but don't show the kind of pleomorphism that you, are, uh, that you expect to see in a, you know, in a, a non-small cell carcinoma. And finally, the immunohistochemical clue that I'd like to point out to you here, P63 positive or P40 negative, or both. These are all clues and the more of these clues that you have in a particular case, the more suspicious it becomes for nut carcinoma. We are beginning to see more of these cases at Cleveland Clinic because we are uh, part of a um, phase one clinical trial for a BET bromodomain inhibitor, which is called BI894999. This trial is being run in four centers and we are one of those centers. And because we are a referral site for those, we are seeing patients that come here and their materials are coming here. So we are seeing more and more nut carcinomas as time goes on. It's very important to identify this um, uh, you know, rare and aggressive tumor, especially because now uh, clinical trials are, are being conducted. So thank you very much for your attention, and I, I hope that this presentation enables you to make a diagnosis of this um, aggressive and rare tumor.